up on primetime news, chief nuclear envoys from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are set to meet here in Seoul for talks on deterrence as Pyongyang continues to ramp up its military provocations. This ahead of another round of talks awaiting Korean and U.S. envoys in Beijing. Thousands of Japanese historians urged their government to stop distorting facts about sexual slavery during World War II, while criticism flares over Tokyo's latest UNESCO bid. And Korea celebrates Buddha's birthday. The message for this year, peace and reunification of the two Koreas. Stay tuned for these stories and more. And welcome to Primetime News on this Monday, May 25th. I'm Hwang Ji-hye. And I'm Paul Yee. Thank you for joining us. We start off with talks between the chief nuclear envoys of South Korea, the United States and Japan that will kick off tomorrow here in Seoul. Their discussions will center around ways to step up pressure on Pyongyang as the reclusive regime continues to issue military threats. Kim In-ji has the details. The chief nuclear envoys of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will be in Seoul on Tuesday to share their assessments of the recent situation in North Korea and its nuclear threats. The two-day meeting will involve Korea's top nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, and his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Sung Kim and Junichi Hara. The three serve as delegates to the long-stall six-party talks on denuclearizing North Korea. Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry says the three will seek to make substantial progress in the North Korean nuclear issue through deterrence, pressure and dialogue. The trilateral talks come at a time of growing uneasiness about the situation in North Korea. Pyongyang recently claimed it successfully test-fired a ballistic missile from a submarine and said it now has the capability to miniaturize nuclear weapons, a crucial step toward building nuclear-tipped missiles. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un also reportedly had Defense Minister Hyun young chol executed, raising doubts about his grasp on power. Meanwhile, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo are seeking to take action against the regime at the UN, saying that the recent test firing is a violation of UN resolutions. The last meeting between the three countries was held in January in Tokyo, where they agreed that the North should first demonstrate it is sincere about denuclearization before returning to the six-party talks. The talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, were last held in December 2008. Kim min Arirang News. And wrapping up talks in Seoul, chief nuclear envoys from South Korea and the U.S. will head to Beijing for another two days of talks with their Chinese counterpart starting Thursday. The three parties, however, will not be holding trilateral talks. Instead, separate meetings between South Korea's representative and China's top nuclear negotiator, Wu Dawei, and the same time, same with the U.S. envoy, will take place. The unprecedented simultaneous visit of Seoul's and Washington's envoys to Beijing comes as China's active role became more important in the face of the North's growing nuclear threats. And while such provocations prompt questions over the stability of North Korea and why the regime is doing so, our Hwang Songyi sat down with former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Donald Gregg for his insight on the reclusive state. You visited North Korea last year, and, the, and your previous visit was when Kim Jong-il was in power. So did you sense a difference in tone among the North Korean officials there? I sensed a big difference. I had last been there in 2008 with the New York Philharmonic, and I went uh, last February. Uh, Kim Gae-gwan had been my usual contact. He'd been promoted, and so I de dealt with Ri Young ho I said, I think we make a terrible mistake in not talking with you. And he said, well, we don't think President Obama's going to talk to us. Uh, he's got enough on his plate. So we'll just wait until there's an American president who is willing to talk. And in the meantime, the sky is the limit for us under Kim Jong-un. Now, I'd never heard anybody say that before. And Pyongyang itself looked very good. Uh, people were wearing better clothing. 
everybody seemed to have a cell phone. And I could tell that the North Koreans were very proud of what they are accomplishing and are very optimistic about what they will accomplish in the future. You once mentioned in an interview of a chance that Kim Jong-un could have been educated in the U.S. Do you think this was a missed opportunity? When he came, uh, first surfaced in North Korea, uh, I knew he had been uh, educated in Switzerland, was a basketball nut, a great fan of the Chicago Bulls. And so I wrote uh, Vice President Biden saying, here's a young man who's going to be around for decades. Here's a chance to bring him to the United States, uh, show him around. I added in my letter, they may not accept it, but they'll never forget the fact that it was offered because it was an offer of respect. And we do very, very little of that with the North Koreans. And I think it was a real missed opportunity. Secretary Kerry recently spoke of more sanctions on North Korea. Do you think this is the right time to put more pressure on North Korea? We've recently learned that North Korea is selling a great deal of anthracite coal to China, and China is paying hard currency to them. That's their largest source of hard currency, and that they are doing it in ways that don't register on the sanctions. So I don't think the sanctions are very effective. They hurt the little people, and they haven't stopped a major flow of hard currency from China into North Korea. The Obama administration has been making efforts to mend ties with Iran and Cuba. Could North Korea be next on President Obama's list? I wish that uh, Obama would reach out to North Korea, but I don't think he will because he's under fire from the Republicans already for reaching out to Cuba and Iran. And we have demonized North Korea to the extent that there's absolutely no political support on anybody's part urging President Obama to reach out to North Korea. If he did it, he would be moving solo. So I think it would be a very difficult move for Obama to make against the feeling that's rampant in the United States that, that Kim Jong-un is, is going to collapse. And I don't think that's going to happen. We're going to be dealing with him for a long time, and the sooner we start, the better. Thank you, Ambassador, for your time today. My pleasure. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is highly likely to visit China in September to attend an event marking the 70th anniversary of the Allied victory over Japan. Xu Guangyu, a retired major general in the People's Liberation Army, made the comment at a recent symposium held by Hong Kong-based Phoenix Satellite TV. Xu said the event holds great political significance and that if Kim does not show up, it could complicate matters with China. The defense expert added that the young leader could use the visit to gain Chinese support in the six-party talks. If Kim actually does make the visit, it would be his first overseas trip since he assumed power in 2011. Today is a special day for Buddhists in Korea. It's Buddha's birthday, his 2,559th. For those of you keeping track, hundreds of people in Seoul from the faithful to the curious celebrated the occasion at Chogesa Temple. Connie Kim was there and brings us this report. It's celebration to mark Buddha's birthday. Hundreds of people made their way to Chogesa Temple to hear the celebratory message delivered by the head of the Choge Order of Korean Buddhism, the largest Buddhist sect in the nation. In this year's message, the Venerable Chasun commemorated the 70th anniversary of Korea's independence from Japanese colonization and called on the two Koreas to build trust through exchanges. It is painful that the two Koreas have been confronting each other for the past 70 years. We must end this conflict. The Choge Order is proposing three pathways to unification, coexistence, harmony and united minds. He added the reunification of the two Koreas is no longer just Korea's wish, but the wish of people around the world. Yearning for peace and the reunification of the two Koreas, a joint South and North Korea prayer was presented for the first time in four years. 
We must work toward carrying out the landmark statements signed by both South and North Korea, such as the July 4th, June 15th, and October 4th North-South declarations. That is the way our nation will head toward peace and prosperity. Those who came out on this special day also participated in the bathing of the Buddha ritual, in which they pour water over a statue of a baby Buddha to pray for peace, wellness, and for their wishes to come true. I'm praying for the well-being of our family, for everyone to be healthy, and my friends and relatives to prosper. Everyone who made the trip to one of the 20,000 Buddhist temples around the country today seemed to have the same purpose, to be happy and enjoy the sunshine on what was a beautiful spring day. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And in a message marking Buddha's birthday, President Pakane renewed her commitment to revitalize the economy and reform the country. The message was delivered by Culture Minister Kim jong duk at the Chogesa Temple, the Buddha ceremony today. The president called for national reconciliation through Buddha's teachings of wisdom and mercy, adding that the government will make every effort to bring happiness to the people. The speech comes as the president struggles to overhaul the pension program program for civil servants while continuing her deregulation drive and efforts to eradicate corruption. It might be a public holiday for the vast majority of people in Korea, but one person who will be busy working is Prime Minister nominee Hwang Kyo-wan as he prepares for his upcoming confirmation hearing. If Hwang is confirmed, an analyst say President Park Geun-hye will have fresh impetus to forge ahead with her reform drives. Ji Myung-gil has more. A motion will be sent to the National Assembly on Tuesday to ask for a confirmation hearing for Prime Minister nominee Hwang kyo -an. The nomination requires a parliamentary endorsement and Hwang is expected to undergo a tough confirmation session within the next couple of weeks. I will fully explain any suspicions surrounding me at the hearing. Whether Hwang passes the confirmation hearing remains unclear, given the main opposition party's resistance to the prosecutor-turned-justice minister. We don't know how the prime minister nominee will be able to look after state affairs amid claims of real estate speculation, evading military service, and receiving a lawyer's fee of over one million U.S. dollars. The ruling's Henry party has called for a thorough probe into Hwang's credentials to avoid the potential embarrassment of him, suffering a similar fate as his predecessor, Lee Wan Gu, who was forced to step down over allegations of corruption. We urge the opposition to avoid making the confirmation hearing a tool for political attacks and focus on verifying the nominee's capabilities and qualifications. President Park Geun-hye's choice is interpreted as reflective of her push to fight corruption, as well as her major deregulation drive to help revive the stagnant economy. The parliament is required to hold confirmation hearings and a vote for the nominee within 20 days of a motion being filed. The prime minister is the only cabinet post that requires parliamentary approval. Jim young Arirang News. And in other news, thousands of Japanese historians are calling on the government to stop distorting its wartime past. That includes the sexual enslavement of Asian women by the military during World War II. Kim ji reports. A coalition of 16 history research groups in Japan, numbering 6,900 scholars in total, has called on Tokyo to stop distorting facts surrounding the military's wartime sex slavery program. In a statement Monday at the parliament building in Tokyo, the scholars said if Japanese politicians and media continue to shy away from the facts about the sex slavery issue, it's the same as sending a message to the international community that Japan does not respect human rights. The group also said the overwhelming amount of testimony from multiple witnesses from Korea, China and Indonesia consistently points to the Japanese military's use of force to sexually enslave women during World War II. The historians argue that even if the women were paid, it does not justify Japan's actions and reiterated a need to address the systematic abuse of these victims by the military.
Their action call follows another statement lodged earlier this month by an international group of 187 renowned scholars who urged Japan to acknowledge the issue and deliver an apology. Historians believe that more than 200,000 Korean and other Asian women were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during the war. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. An American professor is urging Japan to set the record straight on its history of wartime industrial facilities. Tokyo is attempting to enlist them as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Son Jong-in reports. Alexis Dutton is one of the coordinators who led the landmark signing of a statement earlier this month that calls on Japan to accurately address the history of its colonial rule and wartime aggression, including its sexual enslavement of women. The University of Connecticut professor is now criticizing Japan for its attempt to enlist its wartime industrial facilities as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. She stressed that the Shinzo Abe administration should first make public the facility's sad history. The Japanese government's effort to do so come, uh, come together with an honest accounting of what happened at especially, I believe it's six or seven of the sites that relied very heavily on Korean slave labor. International efforts to stop Japan from whitewashing history started with a similar statement signed by 20 historians in February, with the number of supporters having now grown to nearly 500. The statement highlights the sexual slavery issue in particular, and Dutton says the reason for that is not only because of Japan's efforts to distort history, but also because it is an affront to all the women who suffered during and after World War II. This seems to be the one that has been most politicized this past year from the Japanese government uh, had attempted to censor an American textbook. Dutton says the scholars are also receiving support from many Japanese citizens who want to be part of the movement to set the record straight. Now, it remains to be seen how Abe, who once said that controversial historical disputes should be left to the historians, will respond to the growing criticism raised by the historians themselves. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Historical records on Japan's wartime sex slaves or comfort women have now become national heritage in China. China's media reported Monday the State Archives Administration recently declared a set of 29 written documents on the issue as national heritage after nine archive bureaus in China applied for the listing in 2013. The Comfort Women documents include confessions by Japanese war criminals who admitted to turning J Chinese rather homes and buildings into military brothels during the 1937 Nanjing Massacre. A bureau representative stressed the importance of these documents, saying that most of the victims who could have served as witnesses to Japan's wartime atrocities have passed away. And now for the top international headlines, we connect to Stephen Chue at the News Center. One month has passed since Nepal was hit by the deadliest earthquake in its history and that ravaged the country and killed over 8,000 people. And after a powerful, another powerful tremor struck two weeks ago, residents still live in fear of more quakes. Stephen, tell us more about the recovery efforts going on there. Exactly one month ago, a devastating 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Nepal. Two weeks ago on the 12th, another violent quake once again shook the nation, inciting fears that there may be more to come. The situation has not returned to normal. This morning I felt an aftershock, and our family is still very worried and scared, especially our kids. They're afraid about what is going on. As part of the ongoing reconstruction efforts, unsafe buildings are being intentionally torn down to make way for new construction. The crowd looks on as the wrecker tears down the walls off a flimsy structure. And in the, in the central part of Nepal, boarding school students gather to pray for the victims and their families. It's an inspiring gesture from the children who are eager to return to school, which has yet to open after the quakes. Still, it's clear that a return to normalcy may be a long time coming for the residents, many of whom still live in makeshift houses and tents. Some good news, though, as international aid has begun to trickle in. 
The Nepali government has estimated the damage to be about 10 billion U.S. dollars, and the United Nations says they've only received a fifth of the $415 million it needs, pointing to the need for urgency from the international community. And the United States has bashed Iraqi forces for having showed no will to fight Islamic State militants during the fight for the strategically important city of Ramadi. Speaking on CNN's State of the Union program on Sunday, U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter slammed Iraqi government forces for withdrawing, despite the fact they vastly outnumbered the opposing force. Carter's comments are the harshest assessment yet from an Obama administration official about the Iraqi army. Islamic State militants are now in control of Ramadi, rapidly trouncing Iraqi forces, despite the support of U.S.-led airstrikes that had bombed the extremist positions. Meanwhile, the Libya Observer has reported that a North Korean doctor and his wife were kidnapped by Islamic State in the city, city, the Libyan city of Sirte. According to the report, the couple was abducted after finishing up work at a local hospital as they were returning to the capital of Tripoli. And over in France, the Cannes International Film Festival's prize for the top film, the prestigious Palme d'Or, was awarded to French director Jacques Audiard for his film, Deepin. The film tells the tale of former Sri Lankan Civil War fighters or Tamil Tigers who pretend to be a family to gain asylum in France and start a new life. Audiar said he was extremely moved the jury picked Deepan as the top film. I think that the actors, the characters were overwhelming, so I'm not surprised. Well, yes, I am surprised, but I think that's what touched them. The French director has two smaller Cannes awards to go with the latest win, one of which is the Grand Prix awarded to him five years ago for the film A Prophet. And finally, Nobel Prize winning mathematician John Forbes Nash, whose life inspired the film A Beautiful Mind, has died in a car accident in the U.S. state of New Jersey Saturday. The 86-year-old and his wife were thrown from the taxi they were traveling in as it crashed into a highway guardrail. Nash will be remembered for his groundbreaking work on game theory and as the subject of an Oscar-winning movie that depicted his struggles with paranoid schizophrenia. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. Good night. Today was a scorcher with summer conditions setting in and not surprisingly, record highs were posted in many parts marking the hottest day of the season. And a heat wave advisory was issued for the first time this year in parts of Gyeongsangdo, Jeollado and Gangwon-do province. And if you're in those regions, get ready. Tomorrow will be even hotter than today. Seoul will jump up to 30 while Daegu Sea highs skyrocketing to 34 tomorrow afternoon with clear skies in store. I mean, there will be nothing but sunshine throughout the day tomorrow. So the UV index will also be very high across the nation, especially in Gyeongsangdo province. So make sure to stay protected and try to avoid being outdoors in the afternoon. Now on to Tuesday's readings. The daytime high here in Seoul will top out at 30 and Daegu and Gwangju will climb to 34 and 32, while Kusa peaks at 27 tomorrow afternoon. And as for the other regions, Adejan and Jeju Island will see a high of 31 and 25, while Dokdo rises to 27. Now the heat wave will persist throughout the week this week, so take good care of your health. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
And that wraps up our newscast. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Paul Yee. And I'm Hong Jie. Please join us at the same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.